right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Gardening for Pollinators. We're going to talk today about gardening for pollinators in North Texas. So um, I'm joining you from Tarrant County. And so most of this information is going to be based around Tarrant County. And before I get started with the pollinator presentation, I'm just going to go ahead and talk a little bit about um, some housekeeping items um, and about the rebate and about Tarrant Regional Water District. So um, this presentation is supported by our regional water supplier, which is Tarrant Regional Water District. And so um, TRWD has basically three main missions, and that's water supply, flood control, and recreation. And so we basically maintain the, um, the surface lakes and the pipelines and everything that are needed to um, bring surface water from those storage lakes over to our um, water treatment plants that are owned by our cities here in Tarrant County. So we provide the raw water to the water treatment plants. They treat that water to drinking water standards and our cities pipe that out to all of our homes and businesses. Um, we also do flood control, so maintaining the levees in, um, along the Trinity River and then also recreation. So of course our Trinity Trail system, we have several parks um, associated with both the Trinity River and with um, several of our lakes that we own. And so you might be wondering uh, why Tarrant Regional Water District is talking to you today about gardening for pollinators. And that is because um, conservation is really an important water supply strategy so that we can continue to provide water in the future. Um, the population of Tarrant County and the entire DFW area is set to double in the next 50 years. And so we need to make sure that we're making smart water decisions now so that in the future, uh, we will have plenty of water for that increased population. And so um, one of the ways that we do that is we provide these educational opportunities. Um, and there are many different things that you can do to help save water in your home. And um, gardening for pollinators is one of them. But we have several different programs. So if you go to savetarrantwater.com, that is our conservation facing website. And so you can learn about all of our events, um, information. You can sign up for a free sprinkler evaluation. So if you're a Tarrant County resident, we will actually um, pay for a licensed irrigator to come to your house to take a look at your irrigation system, let you know if there's any inefficiencies or um, any problems or anything, and also let you know exactly how much that uh, water that is using. You can also sign up for free weekly watering advice. That is custom to your location. And um, Every week, every Monday, you get a text message or a email, whichever you choose, and it tells you exactly how much to water your grass at your home's location. Um, in addition to that, we also partner with other organizations to provide these educational um, opportunities. So we partner with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, we partner with the Tarrant County Master Gardeners um, and several other organizations as well to provide these um, wonderful opportunities to the public. And so now that I've talked a little bit about um, TRWD, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some housekeeping items. So if you have any questions throughout the entire presentation, you're welcome to type them into the Q&A box. I will go check the Q&A box at the end of the um, presentation and I will address all of those questions there. So please go ahead and type them at any point in time and I'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, also, if you look in your control panel, there should be a little area where you can download a handout. The handout is just a gardening for wildlife handout, and it goes over much of the information that I'm going over today. And um, you can uh, just take a look at that, take it home with you or whatever, and download the PDF so that you can have that information in the future. Um, and I am Heather Bass. I work for Tarrant Regional Water District, and I'm a conservation coordinator. I work on um, basically helping people save water uh, through landscaping, native plants, um, that type of thing. And this, is, um, this presentation is also in partnership with many of our cities um, here in Tarrant County. So North Richland Hills, Mansfield, Arlington, um, all in on this with us as well. And one of the opportunities that is being offered with this presentation is a $25 Go and Grow rebate. So right now I am live, but you can also get this presentation on demand from September 4th to September 10th. Um, and if you watch this live presentation or that on-demand presentation that is going to be available, um, you can apply to get a $25 Go and Grow rebate. And so what the Go and Grow gardening boxes are is you can go to rootedin.com. There are two boxes available, a pollinator box and a shade box. And um, I believe they are $85 each and they each contain 24 plants. So it's enough 
plants to cover about 100 square foot of your um, garden. And they are specifically chosen to be hardy in our North Texas climate. Um, the, the pollinator one, of course, specifically chosen to attract pollinators. The shade one, of course, specifically chosen for shade plants, but these are all native or adapted plants. They're gonna be low water use and very, very easy to care for. Um, again, it's, I believe they're $85. So then if you are able to get the $25 um, rebate, that makes it a really good deal for 24 plants. Um, and this is available for Tarrant County residents only. And the way to do that is just check your email after this. Um, tomorrow, I will send out an email. It will have a link to a form. You go into the form and you tell me, you know, your order number and all of your information and everything. And then we'll be able to um, issue the rebate. I would suggest not waiting until the rebate information comes out to buy your box because sometimes they do sell out quickly and once they're gone, they're gone. There aren't any more until next spring. So um, if you're wanting to get one, please go ahead and do that. Um, you have to order them and then they're picked up on September 17th and you get to choose uh, from a bunch of different locations there on the website. So um, again, uh, look, look for an email after this presentation and um, you'll get a link to apply for the rebate. Okay, so now I'm going to actually start talking about gardening for pollinators. So as I said, this um, class is really geared toward uh, North Texas, Tarrant County, our landscapes and um, gardening for that. But a lot of the advice that I'm giving will also um, translate to most of Texas and especially North Central Texas. And so um, so first off, you might be wondering why exactly we are talking again, uh, why are we talking about, you know, building a pollinator garden? And that's because um, pollinator gardens are really good for water conservation. So um, as I said, water conservation is an important water supply strategy so that we can continue to provide water in the future. Um, as it is right now, most of our water waste comes from residential outdoor water waste. So during the summertime, um, you know, when it's really hot and really dry, 60, 65% of our residential water use is all outdoor water use. So more than half of our water use during the summer is to water plants outside. And so um, that is why uh, I'm talking to you about this today, because basically um, one of the things that you can do, there are several things you can do to create more smart, efficient landscaping that is gonna save you um, water, time, all of that. But one of the things that you can do is create a pollinator garden. Generally, pollinator gardens are um, based upon native plants. Native plants are gonna be lower water use. Not only are they lower water use in general, but they're also drought tolerant and um, of course have evolved with our climate here and are happy to be hot and dry. And so that's sort of why pollinator gardens um, are good for water conservation. And so, as I said, if you just want to boil it down to one thing, how to attract and support pollinators is basically planting native plants, right? Um, and so that's mainly what I'm going to talk about today, although I'm also going to talk about all the other different things that pollinators need in order to um, survive. And so um, it's not just the plants, but mainly it's the plants. So native plants are the way to go. And I'm gonna talk just briefly about why native plants. So why native plants are so awesome. When it comes to our pollinators, our native plants evolved with our native pollinators, right? And so um, many of our native pollinators need a specific type of plant or maybe a plant in a specific family in order to continue their life cycle. Um, that could be anywhere from them needing it for food, um, them needing it for food for their larva maybe, like a caterpillar eating a specific type of plant. Um, Maybe they need it for nesting material or, or something like that. But um, basically all of these pollinators that we have in this area have evolved with all of our native plants from this area. And so um, they have evolved to, to both depend on each other. So it's not just our pollinators that are depending on our plants, but of course the plants also get pollinated by pollinators. And so the plants also need our pollinators. Um, so it's a, a, a relationship where they need each other. Um, but in addition to that, you know, besides just the pollinator thing, Native plants are great. Um, they have thick above and below ground vegetation. And what that means is we're gonna have um, increased carbon sequestration. We're gonna have 
on the surface, our water is going to be slowed down. So when we do have flooding, that water is going to slow down a little bit more. Um, it's going to get filtered. So more of our pollutants and everything that could be in that storm water is going to get filtered out. And also slowing it down helps it infiltrate into the soil a little bit better instead of it all just running off into you know, the street or, or wherever. Um, in addition to that, there's giant below ground roots. You can see the picture that I have here, these two kids next to a, uh, a big blue stem grass. And so um, those giant roots below ground is how they stay drought tolerant and how they can still suck up water when it's super, super dry outside. Um, but it also helps break up the soil and makes it to where, again, when it does water or when it does rain, that water is seeping down into our soil and actually getting um, kept inside there. And so. Um, many different things that native plants can do, but that is the basis of, of why we care about native plants. So I just wanna start off by saying that just because you're planting native plants does not mean that you need to have a specific garden design. You can really do any type of garden design that you would like with native plants. Any, pretty much any type of plant that is maybe a traditional non-native plant um, that you like the look of, that is maybe high water use or a little bit more resource, resource intensive than you would like, you can always go and look for a native plant that might look similar to that, have a similar um, texture, growth structure, color, flower shape, that type of thing, um, but it's gonna provide more ecosystem services and it generally be easier to care for and use less water. And so um, I like to think of like the, uh, the um, cottage style garden is a really good type of style that goes well with a pollinator garden, but honestly, you can do whatever you want. Um, any type of garden design you like, if you like it more formal, you can totally do that with um, pollinator plants and with native plants. Um, in addition to that, you can go sort of the opposite direction and do a more uh, natural thing, which is like a wildflower meadow or something like that, or a little prairie patch. Um, a lot of times people do that on what is called like the hell strip. So that strip of land that is maybe between the street and your sidewalk, it stays really hot, it stays really dry. A lot of people don't have irrigation there. And so um, creating something like a little wildflower meadow is great for pollinators and a great way that you can maintain that area with very little um, care. And so I'm just gonna start out by talking about like what is a pollinator garden and what exactly are we creating? So um, pollinators are, are animals, generally insects, but other animals too, um, that pollinate our, our, our plants. And um, in order to create a pollinator garden, you're basically needing to provide everything that those pollinators need in order to have their life. So food and water, of course, both very, um, very important housing, shelter, a lot of times that's just, you know, plants and things like that that they use for shelter, um, and then nursery, so somewhere to raise their young, and um, in terms of caterpillars, that's going to be a specific type of plant that the caterpillar is going to eat, and so um, those are your main things, um, categories that you want to hit whenever you're creating a pollinator garden to make sure that you are completely providing for um, whatever pollinators you're wanting to attract. And in terms of that, I just want to remind everyone, you know, most of the time when people think about pollinators, we think about butterflies and bees. Sometimes we think about hummingbirds um, and things like that, but there are tons of other pollinators out there. So um, birds, bees, bugs, so true bugs, um, flies, moths, bats, beetles, I mean, the list goes on. Um, many different things pollinate things. Mammals pollinate things as well. Um, so there, there are plenty of different um, types of pollinators. Today, we're mainly gonna focus on like butterflies, bees, and birds, because those are the big ones. But um, you, can, you can attract any of these things to your pollinator garden. And chances are, if you have a robust pollinator garden that has a variety of different resources for um, different types of animals, you're going to have these different, different things. So um, maybe you might be planting plants for butterflies, but you're going to have bees too. You know, you're going to have birds come too. You're going to have moths too. And so um, tons of different types of pollinators. So starting with that first point there, we're talking about um, providing food, water, and shelter. And so, like I said, the first thing is mainly just planting native plants. Native plants are going to provide, not the water, but um, food and shelter 
um, for a variety of different types of pollinators. And of course, that can matter on what type of plants you're planting. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in general, native plants are the basis for all of this. Um, you want to think about providing a water source. Water source is very important when it comes to um, the very hot and dry summers that we have uh, where water might be hard to find in the wild. And so um, bird baths, of course, everyone's heard of bird baths, but you can also just have like a saucer, you know, on the ground full of water. Um, birds are, of course, larger than things like butterflies and bees, but if you're just wanting to provide water for smaller insects like butterflies and bees, you really don't need anything deep or anything as big as a bird bath. One main thing you want to think about is putting pebbles down in whatever water source you have so that those pebbles come up above the water level. And um, that's just so that insects can, can go in there and get their um, water without drowning. So we want to make sure that they have a place where they can perch and they can get water out um, without it just going from, you know, no water to deep water. And so um, just putting some pebbles down in there can really help that. It can also help with some of the other animals. If you have a larger water source, you know, and you have frogs or things like that, you want to make sure that they can get out as well. Um, another great thing that you can do is install feeders. That is really not necessary. You don't have to install um, feeders. You can feed with um, natural, with plants, basically. But of course, you know, bird feeders, hummingbird feeders, we've all seen hummingbird feeders, um, squirrel feeders, all of that. And so um, that is just something that you can do to supplement, but it should never be your number one food source. So feeders are always a supplementation to those native plants that are kind of going to provide that native food that they need. Talking about providing shelter, um, that can be a variety of things. And so, um, again, different animals and different insects need different things to, to live in. And so um, that can be a variety of things. And you want to create a variety of different living conditions so that you can create um, a diverse set of pollinators and so that you can attract um, many different things that, that provide many or that require many different types of houses. So, for instance, we have plenty of different native bees. Many of these native bees are solitary, solitary dwelling bees. And so um, what that means is, is a lot of times they either dwell themselves as an adult in a solitary condition, or they need something to lay their egg inside of, and the egg will, you know, pupate and everything, um, maybe throughout the winter or so, and then come out later. And so it needs shelter in order to do that. And so you can see here on the screen, I have a picture of a, a bee house or a bee hotel. You can definitely make one of those if you'd like. Generally, you have some reeds um, in there with a hollow, you know, hollow stems. Um, you can also put in like pieces of wood because we have, you know, carpenter bees that drill into wood. You can also put things like rocks, straw, uh, hay, you know, these type of things. And all of those different things will provide um, different shelter opportunities for different types of, of pollinators. Um, rock piles stick piles, just like a pile of sticks. Leave some areas wild, you know, maybe one area of your yard, let things grow a little bit more, don't prune the bushes as much, don't mow as much, that type of thing, because the stick vegetation, um, it also acts as shelter. And then of course, just like um, with the providing the, um, the feeders that I talked about in the previous slide, you can also install houses. So like I said, this is a, um, there's a bee house there. You can do bat houses. You can do, of course, bird houses. Everybody knows about bird houses. And so, um, and again, same thing. If you're trying to attract a specific type of bird, make sure to look up what their housing requirements are because not all bird houses are the same and different bird houses are made for different types of birds. So one of the number one, um, recommendations that I have to easily create a pollinator area or so to um, support pollinators or support wildlife in general is just to let things grow. Um, don't do as much pruning as you normally would. Let things be a little bit more wild. Um, you'll have, again, more of these resources that these pollinators need within that wild area, they can shelter more. Um, but it also helps in other ways. Of course, you're, there's less maintenance going on, so it's less work on you, um, less resource intensive. The taller vegetation that you have, it's gonna um, shield the ground more from the um, sun. 
and from the air. And so that means that you're probably gonna keep a little bit more of your moisture in the soil if you have the thicker vegetation on top. Um, in addition to that, some of the other things I talked about like um, storm water being slowed down and filtered a little bit more and things of that nature. And so um, it really is the easiest tip. Just do nothing, let things grow. Um, most of the native plants that I'm gonna talk about today are all perennials. And so in general, that means you just let them grow through the growing season. And then when it gets to um, below freezing, everything will die off above ground and you can clip that down um, and then it'll all come back next season, next spring. And so um, again, just, just let things grow and let things get a little bit wilder um, so that you can provide more um, resources for these pollinators. So talking about choosing plants, like I said, most of them are gonna be native perennials. So um, these are gonna be plants that come back year after year. Typically wildflowers are annuals. And so if you wanna do um, a wildflower area, that is great too, but it might be something that you have to reseed year after year, depending on how well the plants there reseed themselves. Um, native perennials, again, they're gonna come back year after year. They're gonna die down to the ground and then come right back. So when you're choosing plants for a pollinator garden, what you really wanna think of is that you wanna make sure that you're providing for whatever pollinators you wanna provide for year round. And what that means is you need to have for our growing season, so spring, fall, and summer, you're gonna have at least two to three different types of plants that are blooming in those three different seasons you know, throughout the entire time. Not the same plant doesn't have to bloom throughout the entire time, but you need at least three things blooming in each of those seasons. Um, then it's really great to have um, one, even more if you can, plant that flowers very, very early in the spring. And what that is doing is that is just giving your pollinators a jump start. They're getting that sugar that they need. They're getting those nutrients that they need so that they can start their, um, their life in the spring and can come out of their winter hibernation and everything. So um, having some of those early blooming plants can really be great to kickstart your garden. Um, but like I said, during the main growing season, you just wanna have a variety of different plants that are growing, um, covering different types of pollinators. Or like I said, if you're choosing just one type of pollinator that you wanna attract, just different plants that attract that one. Um, but in general, if you're looking just broadly at pollinators in general, you wanna have high diversity. So different types of plants, different flower shapes, different flower colors, different flower sizes, different textures of the plants, different types in terms of like bushes, um, grasses, you know, woody plants, non-woody plants, vines, all the different things. Um, and then again, if you're wanting to attract a, a very specific pollinator, like if you want to attract a specific butterfly, you just need to look up the habits of that one and see what does it need, you know? And so um, make sure if you are wanting to attract something specific to your garden that you are um, looking that up and doing your research and providing whatever it needs in terms of its shelter, its food and all of that. Um, and then groups of plants. Pollinators are not gonna come to one plant. Um, they want to maximize their effort. They wanna get the most return for their effort. And so um, generally you want to plant plants and at least in groups of you know, three to five plants. Um, and for the most part, you wanna at least have you know, a 50 to 100 square foot area that is Full of flowers in order to um, attract a good amount of pollinators. In terms of finding native plants and knowing if a plant is native or not, and um, knowing if it's good for our local, you know, our local climate, our local soils, and everything, first thing you're going to do, of course, if you're in the store, you're going to check the plant tag. Um, a lot of times that plant tag might actually say that it is native on there. For instance, the one that you can see there on the screen is this Texas Superstars. So Texas Superstars is a um, proprietary company that is making varieties of native plants for Texas that thrive well in Texas. And so if you see something like that, you know that that's probably going to be good. Um, if not, you know, we've all got phones. So just take your phone out and look up what that plant is. If you're looking at a plant tag in a store, and it just has a very basic you know, name um, of a plant that is not a scientific name or not something specific, you're probably not gonna wanna pick up that plant. If you don't specifically know what that plant is, 
um, I would recommend not getting it. A lot of times, if you go to these big box nursery stores, you'll see things like, um, it'll just say like, assorted shade plant or whatever, things like that. Um, you don't want anything like that. You wanna know what you're planting, exactly what plant that is, and hopefully it should have a scientific name on it that you can look up. Because the problem is, is that there might be 10 different plants with the same common name. And so you might look up the common name and think you're reading about one plant when you're really reading about a different plant that is being offered there in the nursery. Um, in terms of native plant nurseries, if you're looking for them in this area in Tarrant County, we have a list of local nurseries at savetarrantwater.com slash pollinator. That is where all of our information about native plants and pollinators are. And so if you're looking specifically for a, um, a nursery in your area that specifically has a large selection of native plants, there is a list there um, that you can take a look at. I also encourage you to look at local native plant sales. A lot of times in the spring and the fall, there'll be pop-up sales from people like the Native um, Plant Society or the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens, uh, places like that, the Discovery Gardens in Dallas, um, things like that. And so they will have pop-up pollinator and native plant sales. And a lot of times that is the best place to get them because they're gonna be cheaper than your average nursery. And then you're also gonna be able to probably get a wider variety of things. Um, because people will kind of be growing some cooler, like rare native plants that you might not see like in your, your average nursery. Um, I recommend only buying, you know, actual plants, not seeds. The only time I recommend doing seeds is if you're doing a wildflower meadow. Like I said, if you're doing wildflowers, those are annual, so they're gonna be seeded. Um, in addition to that, if there's like a specific plant that you need, let's say it's the host to your favorite um, butterfly, you know, and you need that plant and you can't find it in stores, that might be a situation where you might have to grow it from seed, but um, that shouldn't be the case and you should be able to get most of what you need in an actual, you know, potted, already grown plant form. Um, and then lastly, if you are confused about whether a plant is native or not, there is a USDA plants database for the entire United States provided by, um, by the USDA and it tells you every single plant that is in the United States, um, whether it's introduced, native, or whether it is invasive. So you can go, just type in USDA plants into Google or whatever, it'll take you right over to it. And all you need to do is type in your plant name, it'll come up with a map. If Texas is green, you're good, that means it's native. If Texas is blue, that means it is not native, that means it's introduced. Um, if Texas is red on the map, that means that it is um, an invasive plant and should not even be being sold in Texas and you should definitely not buy it. Um, in addition, you can zoom in on the map if you wanna see specifically which area of Texas it comes from. So if you want to zoom in and get a little bit more um, detail about whether the plant actually like comes from North Texas versus South Texas, East versus West, that type of thing, you can zoom in and it'll tell you exactly which counties that native plant has been found um, growing native in. All right, so now I'm just gonna kind of talk about some of the common types of pollinators and what they need to be supported and what type of things they like. Um, so I'm gonna start with butterflies, of course. Butterflies are pretty much the uh, most popular pollinator that everybody wants to see in their garden. And so um, butterflies, they like bright colors, reds and purples. So this is the flowers, we want bright, bright colors. Um, in terms of the flower shapes, they like tubes with spurs and things with a wide landing pad. So you can think of like a sunflower is a composite type of flower and it has this kind of flat area where they can land on. Um, they also like um, nectar guides on their flowers. And so nectar guides are something that sometimes are visible to humans, sometimes are invisible to humans um, that actually will show um, a guide to <laughs> where the nectar is on the flower. And so that's something that butterflies like. Um, it's also worth noting that not all butterflies like flowers. Not all butterflies like nectar. Some of them prefer like rotting fruit. So they will, you know, get maybe sap, sweet sap from a tree or, um, you know, the juice from rotting fruit. And so there are several different types of butterflies that if you just have a, a garden full of flowers, you may never see them. And then as soon as you put out some rotting fruit or let the fruit rot on your, um, you know, fruiting tree or something like that, you will, you'll see these. One of them um, is called a question mark butterfly and it is common in this area. Um, and it's called that because it has a little 
what looks to be a question mark on one of its wings, but it's one of the ones that really likes rotting fruit. So um, if you're wanting to attract butterflies, a really great thing to do, like if you're just wanting to like watch butterflies right there in front of your face, um, old bananas, they love old bananas and beer. They love beer too, that yeasty, you know, flavor. Um, they love that. So you can mash up some old bananas with some beer and put it out on a plate. You will um, attract some butterflies to, to take a look at for sure. Um, in addition to that, butterflies are special because um, they've got caterpillars, right? And so the butterfly, the adult butterfly, they um, come and they're, you know, eating the nectar out of the flowers. Um, but our baby butterflies are caterpillars and they eat plants. And so the adult butterflies come, lay their eggs on very specific plants, specific to what type of butterfly they are, um, and then those eggs hatch, out of caterpillars come out, and they begin to eat the plant. So um, we all know probably that milkweeds are what monarch butterflies need. Um, things in the fennel family for swallowtail butterflies, so um, fennel, dill, things like that, they love it. Um, passion vine for the Gulf fritillaries, those are just some of our common butterflies here, but you can look up whatever butterfly you like as long as it's a native one. Of course, we won't be attracting any, you know, butterflies from South America or anything like that probably, but um, as long as it's a native butterfly and you plant its host plant, you look up what its host plant is and you plant it, you will most likely attract that. And I'll talk a little bit later um, more specifically about monarchs and about um, the different types of milkweeds that we have in our area. But I do want to say just um, the plants will get eaten, right? So if you're planting a host plant, um, don't don't be sad when it gets eaten because um, the caterpillars, that's what they do. They eat it. And you want to make sure that you're planting more than one plant. Um, you might think, hey, think of this. A butterfly comes down, let's say a monarch comes down, and maybe like five monarchs in one day put their eggs on one monarch plant. Well, those five caterpillars are going to hatch. Then they're going to eat all the plants up before they've grown into monarchs, and then they're not going to have anything else to eat, right? And so you want to make sure that if you're planting these host plants that you're doing it in, in large amounts so that they have plenty of places to go and eat and they don't run out of food. So for each, I'm going to talk a little bit first about like what that type of pollinator likes. And then I'm just going to go through briefly like three or so plants that I think are the best ones and superstars for that type of pollinator. And so um, my first best plant for butterflies, starting out with mealy blue sage or Henry Duelberg. Some people have heard call it. That's a variety of it. It's salvia farinacea. And um, really, I'm starting out talking about this in terms of best plants for butterflies. But honestly, this is the best plant for pollinators in general. Most of these plants that I'm talking about, they might attract more butterflies than other plants, um, but most of these plants attract all of these things, right? Butterflies and bees and beetles and flies, all the different pollinators, right? Um, so some might attract some more than others, um, but specifically mealy blue sage, if you just have one pollinator plant in your garden, let it be this. You really can't kill this plant. It will bloom for nine, maybe 10 months out of the year, depending on how our weather is doing. Um, and it attracts everything. It attracts little butterflies, big butterflies, honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees, um, pretty much all of the major um, pollinators that you might want to attract. Mealy blue sage is going to do it for you. So again, if you pick one plant, this is your plant. You want mealy blue sage. Um, excellent for pollinator gardens. Next is Miss Flower. And so this one really is so specific to butterflies. So um, there's two different types. There's Blue Miss Flower and Greg's Miss Flower. You can a lot of times see them interchangeably and um, use those names in nurseries, but they actually are two different plants. Um, Blue Miss Flower is a little bit higher water use than Greg's Miss Flower, but not really. Um, both of them really don't need that much um, supplemental irrigation at all once they're established. I will say that both of these plants are spreaders, so do not put it in an area where you don't want it to spread. Put it in a confined area or let it go and let it spread. For some 
people, this can be a good thing because you can just pull them right out of the ground. You can set them in water. Um, once the new stems come up, set them in water and you've got all new plants and you can give them away to your friends and family or plant them in another area of your yard. But just know that if you plant these plants, they, oh, they will spread. They will not stay in the little clump that you put them in. Um, but this is a superstar butterfly plant. If you want to see butterflies, this is the plant to plant. Um, these plants bloom around fall time. So from around now until, you know, November or so when it starts getting, um, you know, freezing. And that's when all of our, um, that's when we have a really big explosion of, of butterflies here in the um, North Texas area. So summer can be really hot for them. We've got monarchs that are migrating during the fall. Those monarchs are moving from um, north of us and migrating back down to Mexico where they overwinter. So all of those monarchs are coming over us. At that point in time, they have already laid their eggs and they're not interested in laying eggs, but they need um, energy to continue that journey over to Mexico. And so these flowers give them that energy that they need. And um, if you plant this, you will see, I mean, just hundreds of butterflies during like Halloween time, um, just absolutely masses of butterflies on this plant. So um, if you're looking to just attract butterflies, this is the plant to go with. Plant a large um, area of this flower and you will have just tons of butterflies coming to visit your pollinator garden. Um, another really great one is button bush. So if you're looking to attract some of those larger butterflies, like the swallowtails that you see here on the screen, um, button bush is a great one. It's big, it gets pretty big, and it does need a little bit um, higher water use. So you might want to plant this in an area that is maybe stays a little bit wetter in your yard or so. Um, but you can see it creates these little kind of firework looking, you know, explosion looking balls of flowers um, and butterflies just just absolutely love them. And so again, these are um, attract a lot of our larger butterflies. And so it can be a really beautiful display when you see a huge button bush uh, with butterflies all around it. Okay, so now is when I'm going to talk a little bit about milkweeds. And so we all know that monarch butterflies need milkweeds in order to um, lay their eggs and in order for their caterpillars to eat. And so monarch butterflies are, um, they're, they're um, toxic to birds. So they are bright and orange as a deterrent, as a warning, right? Selling birds, do not eat me, I will poison you. And so um, they get that toxin from milkweeds. So milkweeds have a, a milky sap and um, they just love it and they eat it up and it builds up toxins inside of their bodies. There are also several um, mimics of monarchs. So there are several different types of butterflies that you will see that have a very similar, you know, black and orange pattern to monarchs. Um, some of them are, you know, queen butterflies, viceroys. Those are two really common ones that, that um, to the untrained eye, look very similar to monarchs. Um, and they are mimicking the monarchs so that they um, also get that protection from birds, right? So they're like, I'm orange too. I'm also um, poisonous. Don't eat me. Um, some of them are actually poisonous as well, some of them not so much, and they're just um, mimicking the monarchs in order to get that. And so we've got our monarchs wanting to lay eggs on milkweed. And so I'm gonna talk about some of our local native milkweeds and some of the different behaviors that monarchs do. And so um, the three that I have listed here on the top, that is the zygotes or side cluster milkweed, the antelope horns and the green milkweed. Those are going to be your three main, if you live in Tanner County, if you live in North Texas, those are the milkweeds that you are looking for. Those are the milkweeds that will attract butterflies to lay eggs on your plants. There's another type of milkweed that you see listed there at the bottom, butterfly milkweed. Butterfly milkweed is often sold more in nurseries because quite frankly, it has this orange slightly, you know, prettier, more showy, whatever, flower. Um, and so a lot of times people like that look more. Um, however, 
Monarchs do not lay eggs as often on the butterfly milkweed as they do on these other three types of milkweeds that I have listed here. And that is because when the monarch, when the mom butterfly comes, it finds a milkweed and what it does is it takes its little foot and it scratches. It scratches on the plant to see if it senses those toxins. When it senses high toxin level, it's like, yes, this is where I want to lay my eggs. Um, with the butterfly milkweed, it stores most of its toxin in its roots. And so a lot of times mom butterfly will come up and she'll scratch that butterfly milkweed and just not get the toxins from it um, that she wants to feel or not as much of the toxin level. And so she'll move to another one. Now that is not saying that these won't attract any type of caterpillars at all. They will potentially lay eggs on them. But if given the choice, um, they're going to choose green milkweed, antelope horns milkweed all day over butterfly milkweed. Um, and I've seen it happen, you know, many, many times. So if you, again, if you're actually looking to raise some monarch caterpillars in your garden, you want to go for the three milkweeds there at the top. Um, green milkweed is a really great one. It's probably going to be the one that you're going to see the most often in stores um, out of those three. And so it's a it's a really great, it's a compact plant. Um, the green milkweed kind of grows more upright, whereas you see the antelope horn spreads out and is more low growing. Um, the zizodes, the side cluster milkweed, is actually the one that um, is native to Tarrant County and really grows the most here in Tarrant County, but unfortunately it's a little bit harder to find in nurseries, so um, sometimes you might have to get that middle one. I do want to talk about tropical milkweed. I have a big message there. Don't get tropical milkweed. When you, If you go to the store and you see a milkweed and it looks like that orange butterfly one there, but it's not solid orange, it has red and yellow in it, that's tropical milkweed and do not get tropical milkweed. Um, tropical milkweed can actually potentially harm our monarch butterflies rather than um, benefiting them. And that is because all of these milkweeds are gonna be out in the springtime. So um, in the spring and the early summer is when the monarchs come from Mexico and they migrate up. As they migrate up, they're wanting to lay eggs and create multiple generations migrating up through um, into the North United States. Now, when they are coming back down, it is just one generation that comes from the North all the way down to their overwintering areas in Mexico. And at that point in time, they do not want to breed. If they breed, it's called breaking diapause. They will breed and as many insects do, as soon as they breed, they die. And they will not make it down to Mexico. In addition to that, if they do lay any eggs on the milkweed at that point in time in the fall, generally there's not enough time for that caterpillar to turn into a butterfly before it gets below freezing. So the caterpillar is just gonna die anyways. And so the tropical milkweed will still be above ground growing during that fall time when you don't want the monarchs to stop and lay their eggs. During the fall, you want them to stop and you want them to get nectar from your flowers, but you do not want them to lay eggs. And so all of these native milkweeds will already by that time usually be not flowering and below ground, not have that much above ground vegetation left. But the tropical milkweeds will continue to have that vegetation and it will convince the monarchs that they want to um, lay their eggs and that that monarch that lays its eggs will likely die as well as the caterpillars that come out of the eggs that it lays. If you already have tropical milkweed growing and you don't want to pull it out, cut it back before October. So before the monarchs come back over, cut it to the ground, don't let it be growing, don't let them be tempted to lay their eggs. And so that's pretty much um, when it comes to monarchs, if you're wanting to attract monarch butterflies to your um, pollinator garden, milkweed, milkweeds, of course, is where it's at. Um, and in addition to that, some of those mimics that I talked about, such as a queen butterfly, they will also lay their eggs on milkweed. So um, if you put milkweed, you'll probably get a variety of different types of butterflies that aren't just monarchs as well. 
All right, so now I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk a little bit about birds. And so when we talk about birds as pollinators, there's kind of two different things. We've got hummingbirds and then we've got like songbirds, your, you know, regular birds, whatever you want to call them. And so our hummingbirds, they are going for our flowers. Our songbirds, they're going for fruits, nuts, seeds, right? And so if you're looking at hummingbirds, they want a tubular shaped flower, um, like a long trumpet type of thing, you know, where they stick their little beak in there. They like deep colors, they like red, they like orange, that type of thing. Um, they're not really attracted to any type of scent or anything. Um, and of course, you can always put up hummingbird feeders for hummingbirds generally. You will see usually hummingbird feeders, the little, you know, fake flower where they put their um, beak in to get their, you know, sugar juice out of are generally red. And so that's, that's the reason why that those are red. They are attracted to red flowers. Um, and then again, if you're looking for, you know, to attract regular birds, songbirds, migratory birds to your yard, you're looking at um, creating mainly things like bushes, fruit trees, things like that, that are gonna provide fruit and then provide seed later on for, um, for those birds. What you see here is a, that's a beauty berry. So those little um, pink berries that you see there, that's a beauty berry plant. Um, and that is a great native to have for the birds. Um, so I'm going to quickly try to go through some of these um, that are, I'm just going to talk about hummingbirds in terms of pollinators because that's what a lot of people really usually think about when they're um, thinking about um, birds and pollinators. And so one really excellent plant for hummingbirds is turks cap. And the reason why turks cap is such a great plant is because it is happy in full shade or full sun. So if you have it in full sun, you might need to give it a little bit more water, but it's going to bloom a whole lot more. Um, if you have it in full shade, it usually doesn't need that much water and it'll still bloom, um, but it won't bloom uh, quite as much. And, and that really goes for many of these pollinator plants. Pollinators want to be in direct sunlight generally. Pollinators want to be warm. Um, they want to be out in the sun. They don't want to be in shady areas. So most of these plants that we're talking about are going to be full sun uh, plants that are going to attract pollinators. But um, Turk's cap is really the exception and it's happy to be in either. Um, butterflies love it, hummingbirds love it. Um, and it can get really big. We've got some here on the TRWD campus that are, you know, um, six foot wide, six foot tall. So um, it's definitely something that can get large pretty quickly. Another great one is lantanas. A lot of us have probably heard of lantanas and the stores will sell you a large variety of different lantanas of all different colors and all types of things. Most of those are low water use that you'll see in stores, but um, really the one that we're looking for in terms of our native lantana that are, is gonna attract the most pollinators is gonna be the lantana urticoids. And you know that it's that because you will have just the orange and yellow flowers. So if you see some of them have like pink flowers in there, some of them have like red in there. Um, some, you know, are solid yellow, that type of thing. Those are not our native ones. Our native ones are going to be the ones that strictly just have an um, orange to yellow continuum. And again, um, these will attract hummingbirds and butterflies. And it's another plant that you can really not kill. You can plant this and never water it and it will be happy as can be. Another great one is flame acanthus. And so, um, it has a bunch of really small flowers, but you can see it's very similar. It's a tubular shaped red flower. Um, and these will also get big and bushy. So these guys can get pretty large. And um, they're something also that is pretty easy to grow. Um, it'll get pretty, pretty big pretty quickly and you won't need that much supplemental irrigation at all. Um, but this is another great one. You will even see sometimes this plant referred to as um, hummingbird bush. And so this is why. Okay, so last I'm going to talk a little bit about bees. And so first I'm going to say that a lot of people think of honeybees when they think of bees. Um, but really that's not what we're looking at when we're talking about creating a native pollinator garden. There are so many native bees. Um, most of them do not sting. Most of them are solitary dwelling, so they don't live in, you know, hives. Um, and a lot of them are really, really cool. And so um, in terms of our native bees, attracting them, there's really nothing to be afraid of. Um, whereas honeybees, you know, sometimes people are, are fearful of getting stung and things like that. And so um, that's not something generally that our native bees do. We do of course have native bumblebees and a bumblebee will sting you. 
um, but it will likely only be if you're really like messing with it. Um, whereas honeybees can sometimes sting, you know, unprovoked or seemingly unprovoked. Um, but we also have a lot of really awesome carpenter bees. And um, these carpenter bees are big, just like bumblebees. A lot of people um, mistake them for bumblebees, but they're actually two different things. And you can see um, the picture on top here that you see, that is a bumblebee. You can see it's very fuzzy. Um, whereas the two pictures on the bottom, those are both carpenter bees. And you can see that they're just as big, but they're, you know, they're not, um, not as fuzzy as your bumblebee. And so that's kind of how you can tell. But there's some really cool ones out there. One is called a teddy bear carpenter bee, and it is big and fuzzy and tan and looks exactly like a teddy bear. So there's some really cool bees out there besides just your traditional, you know, honey bees. Um, but so the bees, they really like bright colors. They like white flowers, yellow flowers, blue flowers. Um, they see, you know, they, again, they have these nectar guides that they like to use where a lot of times we can't see the nectar guides, but it's something that they can see, it's UV. Um, and they also like things in tubes. They also like things with platforms that they can sit on. Um, they like limited sticky scented pollen um, and then a fresh mild scent for their flowers. And so, um, a lot of these, you can see this is um, up here at the top where the bumblebee is, like that's your Texas sage or your barometer bush, whatever you want to call it. And that's something that's blooming right now. It's something that blooms with um, rain. And so we've just got some recent rain. So ours are doing wonderful right now. We've got a ton of bees just buzzing around them right now. So um, again, if you're looking to attract bees and planting native plants, it's probably going to be those native bees that you're attracting. And again, if you create one of those bee hotels that I showed earlier, that's going to be native bees that you are um, housing. So in terms of bees, a lot, really a lot of the plants that, um, that I've already covered will attract bees as well. Um, but I'm going to talk just about a few. One great one is Zexmania. It um, is good for bees and for our smaller butterflies. So you can see here some of our little smaller butterflies that are attracted to it. It has a smaller flower, um, but it's another one that blooms, you know, for nine months out of the year, and it is very hardy. I mean, you really can't kill it. It's just so, um, so hardy, and um, you really don't need to water it that much at all um, past, you know, the establishment of it. And this is, you know, and it kind of creates a low growing mound. Um, and again, a perennial that you, you cut back in the, um, in the winter time. Another really awesome one for bees is um, this, they call it the black dahlia. It's not black at all. I don't really know why they call it that. Black prairie clover is another thing that is called, but um, dahlia frutescens. And it is a, a low growing bush that creates a whole bunch of these really small little, um, pea flower. So it's in the pea family. And so you'll see these tiny little flowers. And um, when it is blooming, it will be just buzzing with bees. I mean, absolutely bees everywhere. And so um, small butterflies as well love it. I've also seen um, caterpillars on it. So I know it is definitely a native host to um, at least one of our butterflies. I'm not sure which one, but um, this is a great plant. It also looks really good in landscapes because when it's not blooming, you can get the variety that um, has that very kind of like gray green look. And so it looks very nice and like evergreeny, um, a nice little mound. Another great one for bees is purple coneflower. So a lot of us have probably heard of purple coneflower. Again, this is one that you can get in a lot of different colors. Um, that the nurseries have made, but um, the purple coneflower, the Echinacea purpurea, is probably going to be your best bet in terms of our native pollinators. It's also a medicinal plant, so um, it's something that you can, you know, make tea out of, that type of thing, um, and it's going to attract, again, butterflies and bees, and this is all the way, small butterflies, all the way up to the larger ones like monarchs, um, and then this one attracts a lot of honeybees and then a lot of your smaller native bees. Okay, so after going over those three main ones, so our hummingbirds, our butterflies, and our bees, I just want to go over just briefly a few of our other pollinators because, like I said, there are plenty of other pollinators that are out there doing good work. Um, we just don't maybe see them as often or don't think about them as often, but um, some people might want to attract these, and that's super cool, especially the bats and moths. You know, it's really great to have a daytime pollinator garden that also transitions to a nighttime pollinator garden where you've got great things happening at night too. And so, um, bats really like more dull colors. They like um, white, you know, green, 
flowers. Um, again, like they will have the larger um, flowers usually because bats are generally larger than, you know, butterflies and things like that. Um, of course, flowers that bloom at night, they light things with a musty odor, um, you know, that kind of, you know, something that is going to release its odor at night. Um, something a really awesome one is Datura or Moonflower. It's a great native plant, very low water use. It blooms at night, these big, beautiful white blooms, and they will go away by the morning time. Um, and so it's just a really cool plant. Also, a lot of cacti also bloom those large blooms at night. And so that's something that you can use for bats. Um, in terms of moths, again, very similar. You would just want flowers that are going to bloom at night. Um, pink evening primrose is a great one. Yucca is excellent. Blackfoot daisy. There's tons of things you can do to attract moths. Um, in terms of your beetles and flies, they have sometimes more specialized um, requirements. And so, again, with most of, these, most of these plants, you'll see a variety of different types of things. You'll certainly see beetles and flies on them. But if you're specifically trying to attract some of these things, you know, um, that's something that you can totally do. So beetles, dull colors, they like flower shapes that are um, large and bowl-like. So think of like a magnolia tree that's pollinated by beetles. Um, no, uh, no scent really, um, strong fruity scent. So here I've got listed with Delia, purple cone flower, Engelmann's daisy. There's tons of things that can attract beetles if that's what you're looking for. In terms of flies, um, the coolest thing about flies really is that there are a lot of plants that are pollinated primarily by flies and they will create like a putrid odor, like a rotten type of odor. A lot of times it's, it's you know, um, it's not like you'll walk by and smell it. You have to get up close to the flower to smell it, but it's really interesting, you know, um, and there, there's tons of different types of flies out there. Um, and I'm not just talking about, you know, like house flies and things like that. Like there are very interesting types of flies. I think I have a picture later on that I can show you. Um, but yeah, those are all just um, other interesting types of pollinators that you can totally tailor to if you would like to attract them to your pollinator garden. And lastly, just talking about native plants, I just want to say, please do not forget about native grasses. Even though grasses do not have the flowers that are creating that nectar and everything that um, they're coming to eat, they are still needed for pollinator gardens. And so um, they are there for shelter. A lot of these um, insects, like I said, they overwinter in them. They'll lay their eggs in there and the, the egg is, you know, um, processing over the winter. Um, another thing is if you're thinking about birds, of course, they need um, materials to build their nests. Our large native grasses are exactly what they need. Um, they don't want little tiny, you know, pieces of St. Augustine that you've mowed. They want a large reed, you know, that they can use, things that are more stiff and thick. And so our native grasses really provide that. Um, I also see a lot of things nesting in our native grasses. So you see here, we've got that cute little moth there, and he's just like hanging out during the daytime, sleeping, you know, in the grass or whatever. So again, it's creating that shelter um, and nesting materials. And I just want to talk about some of the other cool things that are not pollinators, um, but you still are likely probably going to attract. So just with any ecosystem, if you're attracting pollinators, what you're also going to, going to attract is you're going to attract their predators. And so um, you can see the little thing there that looks like a bee, um, that little fuzzy guy at the top right, that is not a bee at all, actually it is a fly. And it's a fly who's mimicking bees um, so that it can sit there and wait until a bee flies by and then it takes it and it kills it. Um, and so it's actually a predator that is mimicking, you know, trying to blend in, trying to, you know, I'm just a bee too, but really it's not, um, it's there to, to hurt them. Um, if you're near water, you'll see, you know, dragonflies. They're definitely dragon and damselflies a lot of times. Um, you'll see here the little picture in the top middle. That's a turtle. So see turtles all the time. Again, especially if you're near, you know, um, water areas and you have um, these native grass clumps. So a lot of times things like ducks or turtles will go and use them to lay their eggs in them. And so that's something that you can see often in your pollinator garden. Um, and then, you know, this little guy's a little bug there. And then, of course, you see the, the spider. And so, again, when you've got things, um, anytime something comes, its predator is going to come as well. And so um, you might have some cool garden spiders. And, and I mean, this one is absolutely awesome. I saw that one 
um, filling a, a web in between two of the bushes and I walked over towards it. And of course, when you walk over towards your pollinator garden, you will see things, you know, things get spooked and they'll start, you know, flying around and um, it probably got like three different um, bugs in its web just from me, like spooking everything. And um, it went and, you know, wrapped them up and got a good dinner or whatever that day. So again, you, you know, you're creating habitat and um, you're going to, you're going to attract these things. And um, it's a good thing. You want to create a full ecosystem to um, attract and support multiple types of wildlife. Um, not just, you know, your one pollinator or whatever. Uh, okay, so that is pretty much it. Having said that, I'm going to put up these native plant resources. And so, again, these are just resources for you to be able to find the items that you need to make your pollinator garden. Find your native plants that you're looking for. Find your host plants that you're looking for. Um, the Xerces Society you see there, they are a um, nonprofit pollinator society and they have tons of information. So if you want more specific information about creating pollinator habitat, I recommend going to the Xerces Society and looking at, looking at some of their publications. They have so many different things that you can look at, um, so much information there. TexasSmartscape.com is a great one just for our area in Tarrant County. If you don't really know what you want to plant, um, you can go there and put in different parameters and it'll give you a list of native plants or adapted plants to our location. That will be great and fall within whatever categories that you're looking for. Um, I would also say the same thing about wildflower.org. So wildflower.org, that's our Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And they have amazing lists of native plants. Like if you're looking for a list of native plants that promote bumblebees specifically, they have a whole list. And everything that you find on that site will be native to the state of Texas. You won't find anything that is not native to the state of Texas. And so um, it's a great resource as well. I, for one last thing before I begin to take questions, you'll see that I have a YouTube link linked down here. So I am going to go ahead and try to see if I can launch a very short video. This is a video of my um, previous, a polyar garden that I previously had in my old house. And I just want to show is how many pollinators you can expect to see when you plant these type of plants. Um, but I want to say that if you're watching this on demand, I don't believe that the on demand recording will have the video in it. Um, I think that it blocks it out due to copyright issues, that type of thing. So if you're watching this on demand and you do not see the video that I'm about to launch, you can go to this YouTube link here that is on this slide and you will see the exact same video. And so let me see if I can uh, figure out how to launch this video for y'all to see real quick before I um, go and start answering questions. Okay, here we go. So this is an, an October afternoon, about 5 p.m. I came home from work. This is me arriving to my house. Again, unfortunately, I don't have this house anymore, but I took all of the uh, all of the plants with me when I left. And you can see, you know, I'm covering there maybe about 200 square feet here on this side of the driveway that you can see. Um, on the other side of the driveway, I have, a again, a nice mix of of our native grasses and you can see there you see the mist flower on the other side you can see this is the mealy blue sage um, it can kind of be hard to tell with the movement of the camera and everything but i'm really just trying to show how many pollinators you can expect to see i mean it really is just so many that's a rock rose that you see there with those pink flowers the large grass that you see right there that's eastern gamma grass again looking at some of the mealy blue sage you can just see how many monarchs are there um, I'm sure in the video we've already seen, you know, well over uh, 50 monarchs. And then this is that uh, dahlia that I was talking about. And again, you can't tell that much because the bees are just so small, but it is absolutely buzzing 
with bees. I mean, hundreds of them all over that plant. And so um, that's just kind of, you know, something that you can expect um, in terms of planting your own pollinator garden. Okay, let me try to get back to my resources here so y'all can see those resources. And then I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, answering some questions. So let's see. Okay. How do you provide water without encouraging mosquitoes? Okay, that is a great question. So you can do one of two things. One, if it's a very small, like um, shallow dish, just empty it out every day. Every day, change out the water. Every two days, whatever it is, just make sure no mosquitoes are growing in there. If it's a shallow dish, you're gonna have to probably refill it every day or every other day anyways. Um, so you just wanna make sure that you're cleaning it out every time. If it's a larger type of thing, you can get the little um, mosquito dunks or the mosquito nibs um, and go ahead and put those in there. Make sure you follow the directions and do them as instructed and they will not hurt any of our pollinators or anything. Those are specific to mosquitoes. Um, and yeah, so you should be able to do that. But I would recommend just keep keeping a shallow dish and um, just making sure to clean it out as often as possible so that you don't get any mosquito growth. Um, I bought tropical milk weeds from Discovery Gardens in Dallas. Now seeing varying information about them. If I cut the back over the winter, are they that bad? That's exactly what I recommend to do. Um, you're right, there is conflicting information out there. There are studies that have come out that have shown that it has been um, detrimental to monarchs, um, but not everyone is convinced. And so um, it is, I recommend only using those natives because, you know, um, you know for a fact that those native ones are safe. But yes, if you do have tropical milkweed, just cut it down um, around this time of year. So around September or so, go ahead and cut it so that come October when the monarchs come back over, they are not tempted. Um, have been looking for these native Asclepias for eight years. Where can we find seeds or plants? Okay, so if you're looking for plants, um, there are several places where you can buy them. Again, if you are, um, I would first, if you want the most selection, I would go to your local plant sale. So look up your native plant society, um, your local botanic garden, things like that. They will generally have plant sales. Here um, in Tarrant County, there are, if you go to our website, savetarrantwater.com slash pollinator, there are several different um, nurseries that we have listed there that specifically sell native plants and do specifically have milkweeds. One of them that I would recommend is Stewart's Nursery. One of them is Weston Gardens. Another great one is Eco Blossom. Eco Blossom is a, um, it's in West Fort Worth. You can't actually go to it though. You have to just order off the internet and pick it up or get it delivered. Um, but they usually have a great selection of native milkweeds. If you're looking for seeds, always Native American seed. So Native American Seed is our local, um, really the only company that sells 100% native Texas seeds that are um, specifically to the ecotypes here in Texas. And so if you're looking for seeds, um, you can totally get them there. Another great place is um, there's a lot of different monarch um, charities or you know nonprofit organizations that are out there that will help get um, milkweed to you. So if you're looking to do like a large project or something like that, um, there's Monarch Watch uh, and some places like that that will um, provide large amounts of milkweed if you're looking for large amounts of milkweed. Uh, can we get an email list of the plants mentioned in the presentation? I think that I can just send the entire presentation out to everyone as a PDF, so I will try to do that. Um, but I just highlighted a few plants that I love today. There are thousands more that you can find that are excellent. And so um, again, I encourage you to go to safeterrantwater.com slash pollinator. It also has a list of plants there. Um, again, wildflower.org has an excellent list of plants, that, that type of thing. Um, any native plants that are good for really shaded areas like the side of the house? Yes, there are plenty of great native plants that are great for shade. If you're looking for some recommendations, I would go to rootedin.com and look what is in their shade box right now, and you can find several different great recommendations. Um, the tourist cap is great for the shade. Beautyberry, great for the shade. We have um, 
several different native um, ferns that are excellent for the shade. In terms of pollinators, though, it's just a little bit harder because, again, pollinators don't really like the shade. They want to be in the sun. Um, so I believe for most pollinators, for butterflies specifically, um, if you're looking to look for butterflies, you're, it's, you want it to be sunny enough to see your shadow. Wind less than 10, 7 miles per hour and over 80 degrees. And so if you have an area that is always shaded, it's probably not going to attract that many pollinators just because they like the sun. Um, and insects, you know, they don't um, regulate their body temperature like we do. So a lot of times they need the sun to, to get going. Um, thick below ground native plants, are they bad for foundations? No, um, certainly not like these, the, like the picture that I showed with the large grass and everything. Um, those are fibrous grass roots. They are not going to hurt your foundation. Um, I would not, of course, plant woody plants that close to your foundation. So things like bushes and stuff, you know, um, they can, of course, have uh, large, large, thick roots that will hurt your foundation. But any of these perennials that I'm talking about that are just herbaceous perennials um, and any of the grasses, they're not going to hurt your foundation. Can I plant these native plants now before fall? Yes. So I would say now that it's starting to, you know, cool down a little bit, now is the time. So now is the time to plant native plants. Fall is the time to plant native plants. Early October is probably going to be best, late September, but any time between now and November is excellent. Um, so uh, yeah, now is the time. So go ahead and plant these things. In that video that I showed, um, those are all plants that were planted in spring and then I'm showing them in fall. So that video that I showed, that was, you know, maybe five, six months of growth on those plants. Um, so these native plants will really grow pretty quick, <laughs> Excuse me. especially if you give them supplemental irrigation. Many of these native plants don't need any type of supplemental irrigation. So if you do irrigate them, um, they will grow big and get lots of flowers. Um, Yes, I did lose sound when I launched the YouTube. Um, I did unmute myself though, so hopefully you all heard that. If not, I was just kind of describing what was going on. Not much to describe. Lots of butterflies, lots of bees. Um, okay, what are your best recommendations for nurseries that actually stock native plants? Big box stores aren't the way to go. Um, if you're going to places like Lowe's and Home Depot, Walmart, places like that, a lot of times they are honestly selling you plants that will not grow in Texas. Um, they don't care. They're there to make money. Um, they're not there to sell you good plants. Um, local nurseries are the way to go. Local nurseries will actually give you good recommendations and local nurseries are actually going to sell things that grow locally. So again, if you're looking for nurseries that sell pretty much exclusive native plants and have large selections, you're talking about Weston Gardens, Stewart's Nursery, Eco Blossom is a great one. Um, the Painted Flower Farm in Denton is an excellent one. But again, go to our website, safeterrawater.com slash pollinator, and there's a whole list there of um, local nurseries. What is a good early spring, late winter flowering plant? So a lot of times what you're going to have that is going to bloom late in the winter and early in spring are going to be bushes, flowering bushes. So we all know, you know, you see them, right? Um, right at the beginning of spring, fruit trees right? Things like red bud trees, all of our trees have beautiful blooms on them. Those are going to be excellent. Um, Agarita, Mahonia um, are great ones. Um, aromatic sumac is a good one. So it's, for the most part, it's going to be small trees, um, fruiting trees, and bushes that are going to be having those very, very early season blooms. Um, is there a certain way to care for bee hotels? I've read about harmful mice. Yes, there absolutely is. And so um, I don't think I know it off the top of my head, but there is an excellent publication out there. Honestly, I think it's like the University of Georgia or something like that. But if you just go to Google and look up like bee hotels or like creating a bee hotel, there's an excellent publication that a university has put out about maintaining them. And it talks exactly about that. It talks about how to clean them, to make sure that you're not having um, any type of like bacterial growth, fungus, that type of thing. It talks about the mites and everything. And not only does it talk about how to clean them to get, you know, get away from those things, 
it also talks about how to prevent those things. So a lot of those um, situations can be prevented by like putting the, for instance, you know, maybe putting it in more direct sunlight so those things aren't growing or that type of thing, keeping it dry or that type of thing. And so go look for that publication and um, it has how to build your own and then also how to maintain it to make sure that you're not having any type of weird stuff growing in there that you don't want to grow in there. Um, okay, I think that is all the questions that I see. Uh, yes. So thank you so much for joining me this evening. Again, please check your email. You will be getting an email um, with the link to the on-demand video. So if you wanna continue to watch, you know, if you wanna watch it again, if there was some information you missed, whatever, download the handout that I've got there in the control panel so that you can look at that. Um, and also you'll get all the information about the $25 rebate for the Go and Grow box. And I'll send out the form that you can fill out in order to apply for that application. Um, so thank you so much for uh, joining me tonight. And I hope you learn a lot about pollinators and gardening for pollinators and happy gardening. Thank you.